everybody. My name is Donnie Fowler, and I'm a co-founder in San Francisco of Democracy Labs. We build bridges between the political world, the tech, techies in Silicon Valley especially, and the creatives, those artists, writers, editors, producers, especially those people who created reality TV and now feel guilty. Mm -hmm. I want to let each of you tell me your names uh, real quick. We know you, Dan, already. Civis Analytics. Nathaniel Perlman. With? Uh, NGP Van, Graphicacy, Resistance Dashboard, and the Great Battlefield Podcast. Wonderful. Uh, I'm John Hagner with Clarity Campaign Labs, a modeling and analytics firm. Uh, Laura Quinn with uh, Catalyst, a data firm that provides resources to the progressive community. Dan Ratner, CTO of New Founders and CEO of Public Good, which connects the news with ways that people can make a difference. Uh, Mike Sager, CTO of Emily's List. Uh, John Carson, work in the solar energy world now, but worked on a lot of campaigns before that. <coughs> John and Laura and I go back a long time, <laughs> many, many eons ago. So uh, we know a lot, but we don't know everything. That's why we've got a lot of new people up here as well who've been around for less than a decade, some for less than that maybe. Let me uh, talk about how we, how we can arrange this conversation because data can mean everything and therefore it can often mean nothing. So data in this sense is talking about how do we identify and know more about those voters and citizens that are out there. So there are three parts to this. First is how do we collect that information? How do we collect it? Where do we get it from? What are we getting? Second is how do we provide access to it? Who can get it? What can they use it for? And that's the third part, is the uses in the analytics of data. Dan mentioned or referred to the failures of the predictive model in last year's presidential campaign and the problems with polling. Some of that has to do with the math and some of it has to do with the data that, that they analyze. So how you use the data, what you, how you analyze it can tell us a lot. And over the last really five or six years, uh, Silicon Valley has come to, to embrace this term big data. That's also something that's rather uh, amorphous at many, at many points. So who wants to define regular data <laughs> compared to big data? What does big data mean? Somebody. Uh, <laughs> and it would be to say data is you know, the, the basic records that you have about the things that you're interested in, whether it's people or whatever, and big data is all of the interactions all the facets, all the details, all the things that hang off of that data that you can use to infer things about its behavior. But the real answer is just it's big data if you are trying to use it to look at trends and it's data if you're trying to use it to run applications. Anybody want to offer another option? Yeah, big data is if you're trying to talk to a reporter and get them to listen to what you're saying. I, I don't <laughs> think it's a very useful term yeah. you know, for, for what we do, but it's, it's a thing that people grab onto for this big amorphous, the data that lives that, that most people can't get access to. So things like what magazine you subscribe to, what kind of car you drive, uh, which are helpful in a small scale for what we do, but nowhere near as valuable as you know, more basic data on people. I'll offer my view of data versus big data. In 1987, I was a little baby field staffer on a presidential campaign in Iowa, and we used to keep a record of every voter that we were talking to on a little index card. And all of my index cards from my 14 precincts in Dubuque, Iowa, we're in a little recipe box. That's data. <laughs> what some of these guys up here have are hundreds of millions of records that go back years and years and years and come from many, many sources. And while I could go through that little recipe box of my index cards and look at each piece of data on little index card on each voter, there's no way I can look through millions and millions and millions of records as a human being. So in many ways, it's really just about the quantity of data, quantity of information you're trying to mash, mash up and learn something from. And computers can do that, and humans simply can't, can't do it. Laura Quinn, you, you have been truly one of the leaders, evangelists of data in the Democratic Party and the progressive movement. Um, tell us a little bit about where we are today, uh, because sometimes people think that the Democrats are in such bad shape, they have no data, and the voter file is terrible, and we don't know anything about anybody, and it's all broken anyway. <laughs> which is simply not true. Well, given the results last year, it would be not an unfair statement to say that everything is very broken. 
um, <laughs> uh, we do have piles of data. We have gotten a lot better at compiling it. We do have more tools for slicing, dicing, analyzing it. So I guess my concern at this point is for the last 10 years, and I was a, you know, an early evangelist for this, especially after two national elections where there had been basically a tie and the election was decided for Al Gore and for John Kerry by hundreds of votes. And the theory was at that time, if we could build some of these resources to optimize our tactics, especially at the end of the campaign to turn out the vote, we would be able to tip that balance in our direction. And as a consequence, um, a lot of hard work was done to optimize tactics, to use data to solve efficiency problems. And some of the people on this stage, you know, on the Obama campaign, Dan Wagner, John Carson, you know, they brought some of that to scale in the 2008 and 2012 camp presidential campaigns. And that is tremendously important and good work. But I fear that we've become so over-fascinated with using data to optimize tactics, to build models where we rank order people in terms of how likely they are to support our candidates so we can work efficiently down the list. We can identify who's with us and build out to the edges. And then we're surprised when the message that's designed for the center of that universe starts to deteriorate as we move away from it. And we've zoomed in so close to the bark that we've lost a little bit of the sight of the whole electorate and the whole society and what's happening. Um, so data can be used to optimize and target, but it can also be used to back up and understand the whole electorate. Um, and it's easy when, you know, we're all practitioners, so we all, we all want to grab a hold of the knobs that we can do something about, the turnout knobs, you know, the tactical optimization knobs. But the truth is that the electorate is being pushed and shoved and fractured, it's fraying in places because of forces that we don't control. It's the economic and social forces that are pushing on society in different ways right now. And for a long, long time, Dan Wagner's point on the, the nature of the ecosystem that we are conducting politics inside of, for a long time we had people locked into a binary. We would present the Republican narrative, the Democratic narrative, and those two narratives have not changed very much for decades. We tweak them every election year. We measure them against each other very accurately in our polling. And the media environment had people locked into that because only two sets of actors could afford, they had the wallet, to buy space for their argument. But this new ecosystem has shattered all of that. And it doesn't take much money now to fully offer a new narrative that competes with either of those other two old narratives. The Breitbart narrative has existed in America for a long, long time. Now it just doesn't take much money for it to be fully offered as a new case by Donald Trump. So, you know, because of that shattering of the ecosystem, it becomes even more imperative that we back up and use some of these tools and resources. We get some of the smartest people in our space focused on understanding what is pushing and pulling and fracturing the electorate and where it is fracturing it and most importantly, why? Like, when we look at the data now, we don't want to just look at this snapshot of 2016 because we, when we look at the voters who just moved to Trump, who used to vote Democratic, we can see the pattern of that deterioration building over a long period of time. When we see the fracture in the Democratic Party with, you know, the Bernie voters, I mean, that has been building for a long time. And when we start looking at what's happening in the lives of people who just took that left or right turn away from our coalition, there's a lot of things that are going in the, that their lives. Like we see if you have a lot of debt and you're much in a much more fragile economic condition, you're much more likely to be turning away from the Democratic Party at this point. So if we look under the covers and we try to use the data to understand better what is causing people's actual election behavior before we start targeting, before we start deciding to ask our questions and measure them with polls, I think we would um, be better served in um, bringing 
ideas that have more relevance in their lives. And then we'd be delivering a better product, and then we can start optimizing our tactics. Nathaniel, uh, is data evil? I think, is that what I just heard? <laughs> no, it can I, be used for I, good I, and for evil. Yes. <laughs> Here's what I think. I think that we've gotten, that our party has a problem with not being scientific enough and a problem with being too scientific. <laughs> so, you know, I think we can, we don't do a very good job in a, in a scientific sense of evaluating how our, some of our core practices work. You know, we don't have like after postmortems regularly after small elections with candidates figuring out what works and what doesn't work. We also have some lovely things going on with analytics, say at the Analyst Institute, and where we do double blind experiments and we figure things out, but we tend to overinterpret and are too rigid in how we apply some of those learnings. Let me give you just one example that someone told me recently. So the Hillary campaign had read the study that said that if you had a plan of whether you're gonna vote or not, that it raised turnout by a significant amount. So they, as I understand it, went around and, and their field campaign before the election was telling people, asking people if you have a plan or not. And that made a lot of sense, except that you had suddenly this Comey thing, a big intervention, and you had people who are communicating to voters in the middle of massive change, not trying to persuade them that Hillary is still good, this is bullshit, whatever. Instead, they're saying, do you have a plan? And the people at the door were going, uh, <laughs> what the fuck, <laughs> what the F? <laughs> you already asked me that three times, don't come here and ask me if I have a plan. I have a plan, that is- My plan oh, is that to is, avoid you. Right. <laughs> that, that is like, so, so politics is art and politics is science and that's because we're dealing with human beings. And we have to like continue to use our brain as individuals, not operate as cogs necessarily in like a scientific plan. And we also have to get better at figuring out how to evaluate scientifically what we're doing. John Hagner, how do we, how do we avoid that coming in the elections we've got coming up? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. I think we've, we've been in an interesting world. When, when I started doing data analytics, we tried to get people to take this seriously, right? That you should, modeling is real, data is real, there are things we can add value. And I feel like the, the pendulum swung through that and when Dan and John and the Obama campaign did incredible work, and it, it swung too far. And it got to the point that people, I sell modeling all the time, and people will say, well, what, who does the model say we should talk to? The model says you should talk to everyone. It just says this is the correct order to do it in, right? But How about explaining to us what is a model? What does that mean? Sure, so a model is a score. Everyone in a certain region will be given a score, usually from zero to 100, predicting their likelihood to do something. So we worked for Roy Cooper, who was elected in North Carolina uh, last year for governor, and, and every North Carolinian had a score. So in addition to how likely they were to vote for Hillary or to vote for in the turnout, we had a score for how likely they were to support Roy Cooper, as well as how likely they would be to support him after we talked about HB2, the, the trans discrimination law. Uh, so we had all of these scores together, and we could say, this is our universe we want to talk to about this issue, and then this is our universe that we don't want to talk and to. And what goes into these scores? Is it just hocus pocus, throw so it up it, against the wall, or is there something no, it's, uh, solid to it? <laughs> we, Guesswork? We, we start with a voter file, uh, either the Catalyst file or the DNC file or Target Smart file, uh, and we, that is the voter data from the Secretary of State, plus things like what kind of car you drive, if you've been in a, uh, you know, if you have a frequent flyer card, uh, a lot of different online behaviors, different voter uh, commercially available data, and then we'll do a large scale survey. Ask instead of doing 400 people for 20 minutes, we'll do 5,000 people for four questions. Get exactly what we need, and then our statisticians will find the patterns that predict people's behavior based on that. So everyone is given a score for their likelihood to do something. But as Laura very appropriately pointed out, all we're talking about is efficiency. And, and folks, I think, went way too far with that, and they started looking to the model, they started looking at tactics and replaced message. Uh, it, um, you know, the model has never said, I promise, oh, just ignore those folks. That's, that's not, that's interrogating the model incorrectly. So I think that the pendulum is coming back to a good spot. You asked what we're gonna do better going forward. And I think there's a ton of interesting research right now going on in Virginia, looking into 2018 races, of you know, how can we, better listen to people in a, in a smarter way. 
we did the Kentucky governor's race in 2015 uh, where all of the polling said we were gonna win in a blowout. Our polling said by nine, the Republicans poll said by five, public poll said by eight, we lost by nine points. And when we went back and looked at it, voters weren't lying to us when we did these surveys, but we asked 18 questions. And the sixth question was who are you voting for for governor? Through that point, people were voting for the Republican and they told us that. Then we started asking things like, who do you think is more honest and trustworthy? Who is for people like you? And what we found at that point is that massive numbers of Republican voters hung up on us. In our conventional standards of polling and, and uh, data collection for modeling, you only keep people who make it all the way through. But voting is an emotional choice for a lot of people. We were intellectualizing it. So when we asked people to explain why they were doing this, their response, instead of saying, you're right, he doesn't like me, I should probably vote for the Democrat, was to say, <coughs> right, and to hang up on us and disconnect. So we missed a lot of those folks. So I think one of the things that we're doing, a lot of people here are, you know, can we do, I'm convinced that was a big part of the, our data being incorrect in 2016, right? Absolutely. People who w would tell you they'd vote for Trump, they wouldn't tell you why. And if you ignored the, the vote unless they told you why, you're gonna miss a big thing. So we're doing a lot of research on that. Uh, a lot of our modeling is, pretty, we build turnout scores way ahead of time. So we're only looking at people changing their opinion. We're, not, we're bad at picking up changes in behavior in real time. Because we decide basically a year out, this person is 82% likely to vote and we stick with it, no matter what they tell us. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to be better about listening to voters as they tell us whether or not they're gonna vote. And it's really easy after the fact to be like, oh, we probably should have had a different turnout score. We're trying to see if we can predict it ahead of time, which turns out is more useful to our clients. Um, so yeah, those are some of the big things we're working on now. Mike, uh, you work for Emily's List, one of the great advocacy groups on the progressive side. You've also worked at the DNC and, and, and some of the private vendors, mm -hmm. like NGP Van. Uh, what can you teach us about the kind, how we collect the data and what, what do you do with it? Is, it? is it in a file folder? Where is it? <laughs> <laughs> I, and I, I think it sort of depends upon the organization and the culture that's within the specific organization and whether there's chains of accountability set up to, to get this information back in. And, and it varies widely based upon the year, the campaign, the type of campaign, the training of the volunteers, the familiarity with the systems that they're working with, and the infrastructure and empowerment that's in place with those folks. And so, when going back before the national voter file set up at the DNC and before the common systems and things like that, there, I, I, there were campaign, like campaigns, a lot of the times it, it would go back to individual vendors, it would go back to different places if it got entered back in at all. And there wasn't really, there, there was always sort of a gap. And this, I think this gap persists of the value of bringing this information back in. That every, that, Oftentimes people in the field, you're, you're, I mean, the most finite resource on any campaign you have is time. And so if the choice is between talking to more voters or doing your data entry, that's oftentimes something where people will choose only to get to, to go talk to more people and not necessarily to do the work to bring that in so that we can learn from it later on or so that we can refocus where we're going. And, and you see that, I, I spent some time in the nonprofit space, I would, uh, in C3 work, and I saw this very frequently, that we would have partner organizations or part of our, our umbrella who would do work, they'd go pull stuff, they'd work on a ballot initiative, they'd work on, on what have you, and they were not bringing that data back in. And, and it's like, oh, we don't have time to do that, and it's just not important. And one thing I think you saw with, with the Obama campaign, especially in 08 and 12, and in a lot of state parties that really have robust data programs is that there's a chain of accountability set up around doing data entry. And that, uh, I mean, the fact that uh, at one point the data team on OFA got the president on a staff call to say, do your data entry, that <laughs> is really important to, to building a culture around it. But it's vital that it's, it, that culture has to be from across the entire organization. And if leadership of the organization doesn't care about data, then the people on the ground aren't gonna care about it either. But if people at the top of the organization make this a central part and they understand the value of getting that information back in and understand the value of, of continuing to update that information, then, uh, then that will uh, chain through all the way down. So Dan, uh, if, I, if I hope you're the right person to ask this question. So I'm a candidate, I'm gonna run for city council. I'm a, I just got elected state party chair in Rhode Island. Uh, I, need, I need some data. 
What do you, what do you, what, what, I, need, I want some data, give me some data. What is that? What, what, what do you, how do I get it? Where do I go? I think there probably are actually better people to ask that question. <laughs> okay. But I mean, the general answer is that there are a number of companies that are, will provide you with a list of data, at least to begin with, some kind of voter file, some kind of background. Your initial funding is gonna come from the people you know, so the data there is really coming out of your head or coming out of your initial network. Um, but I think maybe a more interesting question is where does the data go? Um, which is after you're done with that, after you've run your campaign, after your campaign is over, whether you won, lost, or whatever, then what happens? Where does it go? And the answer is generally goes nowhere. Um, sometimes some of that data ends up being you know, gifted or provided to a vendor or to the party, but it's by no means a sure thing. And by the time it does, it's usually pretty stale. Um, from point of view of data collection, you know, I think we've looked at that at least a little bit. I think another one, maybe just to ask about at least a little bit, is can you get that data from people? And it just kind of gets a little bit to the point that Dan was raising at the beginning. I'm going a little bit off the ranch on the question, but I think it's an important one, which is I think we think about data right now as something we kind of do to people, as opposed to something that we can do for people. Um, and if we can get people more involved in that mix and say, hey, look, we're not trying to be Equifax here. Um, you know, we're trying to actually provide you with a service or providing you with information, empowering you to get other people to vote um, and get other people to get involved. There's a win there. Um, so if that source can be less about how do we just get any voter file, whatever that voter file may be, and more about how do we get actually people to voluntarily contribute information because it's useful for them to do, I think that will be a big win, but it's something we haven't done yet. So give us your money and give us your data. <laughs> So, uh, Laura and Nathaniel, so um, let me, would you ex expound upon his answer? What, if I'm, I'm running for mayor, I'm, I'm, I'm the new state party chair. Give me some data. What, what is that? Give well, me a primer. So, so the DNC uh, has a 50-state contract with Vote Builder, uh, which w with my company. And through any state party, a Democratic candidate can go and go to the state party and get a login to the van. What if I'm running against the incumbent governor because I think he's a crook? Uh, but I'm a Democrat. You can I still get that data? Well, some state parties are different about that than others. <laughs> but tip, um, uh, typically, you can, yes. And we've also created, in certain cases, a separate system for candidates that the state party can't, uh, won't allow them to run, to run. So you should be able to acquire this, the van through your state party. And then there are a variety of other products out there that you can use. We also provide a fundraising and compliance database, which is sold on a different business model, sold directly to a campaign. Uh, in that, you can manage your donor list, you can file your state or federal election commission reports. And there are a, a, wild, a wide tool set for doing everything from emailing to accepting contributions and so on. So there's a, there's a pretty full suite of things available just through my company, and there's lots of, and we've made, I think about 200 integrations with other software companies and other players that allow, so like this morning there was a, uh, Sang from Voter Circle was here. Mm -hmm. uh, he has some new innovative technology. We've integrated with his software so that you can bo use both his, pl his platform and ours. And that's true for like all of the higher ground uh, funded companies, which is new, uh, new tech companies. There's lots of ways that you can Start with the base of data, add your own lists, which campaigns typically need to do. You know, who did I, who do I raise money from? My, you know, the people that were, that I went to college with, the people that are at my law firm, et cetera. You can pull that all together and, and work with it. And so it, it is, there's a lot of tools out there already. Anything you want to add, Laura? Um. So Catalyst compiles data from the original sources, from the Secretary of State's directly from official sources, from commercial data sources. So we create a national full footprint of the electorate, of everyone over 18, whether they're registered or not. And then it actually surfaces in tools like NGP VAN. Um, so a lot of the labor organizations that we work with use VAN as a, an organizing tool but it also surfaces in many, many other kinds of tools. Um, we, since we are outside of the party, we work on behalf of independent organizations uh, in 
the progressive community only. We're owned by a trust, so we will not work for anyone on the other side. Um, and we operate as a not-for-profit. The data also then gets used by this wide swath of independent organizations for political campaigning, but they're also using it for their lobbying, the environmental community, or they're using it to fuel the CRMs that they use to manage their membership. They're using it for small dollar fundraising. They're using it to do digital advertising. So it surfaces in many different types of tools. So we have an API layer and, you know, like uh, Van, Sangeet's tool and other tools integrate directly against the database, and that's open to any tool builder in the progressive community. Um, and since we're not for profit, for a lot of the startup builders, you know, will provide that kind of access for free while they're doing that development. Um, we also show up in really unusual places. We are also used a lot by academics, uh, a lot of academics working on redistricting right now. Um, Academic political science departments are actually subscribers to the database. Um, we've, we're also, we've also been used in a lot of court cases and are being used in several of the voting rights cases right now. We were cited in the judge's opinion in Texas where they struck down the ID law for the first time. They cited catalyst data and race data by, specifically by name. Um, and we were even used by the Justice Department in some of those lawsuits. So um, this data has so many different purposes and it definitely has important purposes inside tools where people are doing organizing, but it has important purposes um, for understanding in a much broader sense. And I think, you know, that is, data can be used for many things, good and evil. Good and evil. Uh, Dan, and It is clear that the evil. other side is racing hard as well on this yes. one. Dan, uh, social media is the new hot problem. Um, in 2016. It's a problem. It's a problem. How does social media and what's happening there, what people are saying, what actions are being taken, how is that being integrated into this, into the data system we have, the data ecosystem that we currently have? Oh, not well. <laughs> um, I mean, so who, wh who has the most amount of data on voters and their opinions about politics? Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. By far. Who has the second most amount of data about voters and their opinions? Google or Twitter. Google, yeah, right? Google and then maybe the Democratic Republican Party, maybe Twitter down <laughs> there somewhere. And the reason why is because Facebook collects both your information about your partisanship, but most importantly about your the content of your conversations between you and your friends and those moments of political expression. And so when you want to build a look-alike model and then say, I want to find Trump voters out like there. You can do it using the kind of traditional voter file model that we've done. Um, but Facebook has the best database out there and that database gets better and better every day as people put more and more of themselves and their identities and the topology of their communities into Facebook. So, uh, but the problem obviously with those platforms is that they're completely isolated. Um, they don't share. They don't share anything, right? So with Twitter a little bit, you can get a little bit of the feed as I showed in that graphic in order to do it. Um, and so uh, really what you're trying to do is how do you leverage some of the best practices that are out there to best leverage the platforms. The Trump campaign, um, they really did some innovative stuff. I mean, it was evil, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so are the Russians, right? And they, they really did the same thing, which is they said, we're gonna conduct a large series of experiments and we're gonna see how effective those experiments are in changing people's minds about Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, specifically around elevating prejudice, hate, et cetera, these kind of very strong emotions that you know, haven't really been a part of American politics since the 1950s and 1960s. But you know, it's an overseas hostile dictator, he doesn't give a shit. <laughs> so, uh, but these platforms create a great means of targeting those people because the algorithms help you customize your communication, they help you self-identify who those people are. And so a lot of what we have to do, frankly, is figure out uh, how Facebook becomes a core piece of the strategy in the way that the Trump campaign did. I mean, they did thousands and thousands of experiments completely amorally. Right? They, didn't, they, they weren't thinking of the elevating prejudice. They just thought, you know, what content is gonna make people hate Hillary and like Trump? It just happened to be the content that elevated prejudice, but whatever. And I think a lot of what we have to do is obviously I'm not sure we wanna cross those moral standards with what we do in terms of the content that we produce. 
but in terms of the, the machinery that they've built and how they uh, use and leverage the platforms as a core piece of communication. Um, and TV is just down here, right? Mm -hmm. Facebook, Google are up here. That is the primary means of communication with American voters and American consumers today. And they figured out the proper like machinery to measure it, uh, deploy against it, spend against it, and then measure the efficacy of it, and then repeat that cycle over time is something that needs to be internalized as principle number one mm -hmm. and what our people are doing, and we really uh, don't know how yet. John Carson, you and I come out of the grassroots field, dirt under the fingernails yeah. side of campaigns. <laughs> uh, what does this all mean, at, 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 as we say in Silicon Valley, the end user? What does it mean to the volunteer in the field or the field director uh, in the office? Yeah, Donnie, I'd, um, well, I'd like to try to put a I, uh, we do have a lot of dirt under our frigger nails mm -hmm. from uh, being out in the field and doing this. And I'd, I'd like to try to put a fine point on a theme that I'm hearing here that I think is, is so important, especially if you are a new founder of a group that's going to help us fix this whole mess or you're a donor to one of those groups. Uh, and if you don't mind, I'll tell a quick story. Yeah. Uh, January 28th, 1986, I was in my uh, sixth grade science class. And uh, the teacher... Uh, had something she had to go do, so she just put the TV on in the front of the room so we could watch the latest uh, space shuttle launch, because that's what you did in the 80s. Uh, they happened about <laughs> every nine months or so. And so the teacher just happened to be gone as my whole class is sitting there watching this another space shuttle launch. And uh, then it got a little different. Uh, the space shuttle took off and there was this long white plume that happened about a minute. And again, no teacher in the room, all of us sixth graders sit there watching, trying to figure out what was going on because the commentators didn't really know either. And I was the, I was the first one in the room who said, I, I think the space shuttle blew up. And that was a, many of you probably remember what a catastrophic moment that was for the country. In sort of a whole different sphere, space shuttle Challenger exploding absolutely rocked the American engineering world to its core and it caused this self-reflection and self-doubt and examining of what the hell had happened that we're seeing now in the progressive world. Um, I had the benefit of eight years later starting my engineering school. Uh, I became a civil engineer and, and really all of those lessons had been completely baked into really an, a professional engineer's creed and, and oath that engineers really adhere to. And the lessons of what went wrong they didn't re-examine whether or not to use data. They didn't re-examine basic math. What had failed was fundamental professionalism around technology. Politics got in the way. Hubris around the fact that, well, no space shuttle had ever blown up, so maybe one won't blow up. Um, the White House, it was the 80s, right? They didn't like it when we canceled space shuttle launches, so sets of data were created to show that we can launch these things. Anyway, um, uh, that was the, the finding there. So, you know, when I, uh, when I started in politics, my first campaign, I was given a voter file on paper. At the training, I was literally given a physical paper document, and then I went off and got volunteers. Uh, I got whatever volunteer walked by my Russ Feingold field office and saw the little sign in the window, and we would literally photocopy those sheets and keep track of stuff in colored pencil. Then for GeoTV training, I brought my paper copy down. It was put into a fancy computer by Dan Langer, and that <laughs> spit out a, and we used all that in 2000 when I uh, was the Iowa coordinated director and worked for you, Donnie. I was one of only two states that actually had an online voter file, and I was there in the guts of it as we were creating that thing. I have physically gone to county clerk's offices and gotten the printouts. So. When I finally got to 2008 and had just the opportunity of a lifetime to be Barack Obama's field director in that incredible wild ride we were all on, as we were working so closely with NGB Van and Catalyst, creating new things, first time we really ever had real-time national data on an hourly basis, I knew what was in the guts of it. When I saw those numbers, I could visualize the actual Canvas kickoffs that were happening. I knew the quality of the data that was behind whatever that stuff was. And I think, you know, I'm also, besides an engineer, I'm a farm kid. And there's a saying we have about city people, which is those city people, they think corn comes from the store. <laughs> <laughs> they don't understand, like, the guts of what's in it. And I think we, unfortunately, have too many people in politics now who think data comes from algorithms. <laughs> and, um, but 
I find it fascinating, you live out in Silicon Valley, when companies have all sorts of technology issues, right? They all use Salesforce, just like we all use Van, Salesforce isn't perfect, but when a company fails, it was bad management or a bad business plan or both. We don't blame it on technology. When a sh restaurant fails, it wasn't bad kitchen technology, it was a bad restaurant. I find it fascinating that in campaigns, there's technology is something that happens to us or we all have to deal with, or it's this like separate thing, we should go fix technology. No, we need smart campaigns that have an ethos of data matters. And if you are in charge of something that large, then you better understand what it is and how it works. In the 08 campaign, we had very expensive software engineers and I made them all go knock doors so they actually understood what in the heck that was all about. Um, so, do they make you code? Uh, well, I have a fun, co I actually do know how to code, but <laughs> programs that nobody uses. <laughs> so, so anyway, I won't harp on uh, 2016. I just believe as we look forward, just like professional engineers take responsibility for whether or not the damn rocket's gonna build, blow up. If you are in charge of something that big, you should have a fundamental understanding of, of how it works at its core, and you should have people around you who are willing to call BS when something crazy is happening. Like, oh, I don't know, maybe there's a battleground state that you absolutely must win, and your modeling says you're only up five, but somehow everyone agrees that we can send all our resources to Arizona, as an example. <laughs> Which was closer than Ohio at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the f uh, we got one minute and 30 seconds. Who's got a great erudite question? that's gonna change everything. Okay, who has a really simple question? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> Talk to the box. It's hard to take this seriously. Okay. <laughs> um, who comes up with, with the questions for the surveys that you see constantly during these campaigns because it just seems like you're getting your intelligence insulted. When you see what's going on, you know the questions that need to be asked, but they're not being asked. Um, how is this president doing? Are you, you know, um, that's not the kind of question that needs to be asked. So what kind of data comes from this? How useful is that? Um, yeah, often it's, it's the top line that you're talking about. How Do you think the president's doing it? You don't need to know that number, but you need to know of people who think the president's doing a good job, they think something else downstream. So often what those questions are doing is trying to set up the crosstabs that come later of, of the messages that resonate. Do they resonate with people who were already with us or were never gonna be with us or somewhere in the middle? But the questions are designed usually by the candidate's pollster working with the candidate's consulting team. Uh, it's usually a big team. The answer is almost always, oh sure, put that on too. It becomes very easy for groups to keep adding to these surveys and you end up with very long and unwieldy things. It's very few people have an incentive to say, hey, that's dumb, get rid of it. <laughs> um, because people get paid by the minute and the <laughs> more minutes, the more, the more dollars. On. Hello. <laughs> Where are technologists getting their information as far as asset design and improving asset design? Yeah, I think there's an, an there's there's a bank of research. Often the Annals Institute does an amazing job of, of holding a lot of studies and a lot of research. So a lot of where we get it from is looking at previous examples. Um, but there's there's not a, as much creative thinking from sort of totally outside as there should be. I, I do think that the, like as far as in the technology question, I think that you'll find that a lot of the vendors who are in the space and have been working in the space for a while do have a good feedback cycle with the different practitioners that they, they work with, or at least they try to, and, and they'll, do, they'll do a lot of work with user conferences and asking people about the products and also just looking at the data itself that's generated by usage of the product to see, uh, and it's, I mean, it's the same kind of UX work that, that any other software firm or, or what have you would do, and th those are the vendors that are in place that are, are supporting that out there. So the screen here, the timer's screaming quietly at me. Uh, if you're thinking about data, I'll come back to the beginning. You might, you, you, to think about data all in one thing is a big blob out there. Uh, in politics, in organizing, in advocacy, think about data maybe in three ways, just one, one way to think about it. First, where are you gonna get it? Where are you gonna get it, where are you gonna keep it? What are you gonna get? Second, 
Who's going to get access to it? Who gets to see that data? There's a lot of secret squirrel stuff in political data. Uh, third, or part of access too, is privacy and security. Much, much more important these days than we ever expected it to be. And the third is, how are you going to use it? Are you going to use it with your field staff uh, knocking on doors? Or are you going to use it to do very, very high level PhD data science and predictive analytics? Uh, so data is, is a big, big topic. If you break it into little pieces like that, maybe that's a good way to think about it if you're the practitioner out in the field. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks, Donnie.